You are listening to an audiobook recorded with an AI narrator. If you'd rather read this story, you can find links to the ebook and paperback editions in the video description. Rebel Without a Clause A Little Tombstone Novelette Little Tombstone Cozy Mysteries Book 2 By Celia Kinsey This is a work of fiction. Names, characters, places, and incidents either are products of the author's imagination or are used fictitiously. Rebel Without a Clause, a Little Tombstone Novelette Copyright 2020 Celia Kinsey All Rights Reserved Chapter 1 Five days before Christmas, I was in the dining room of the Birdcage Cafe helping my second cousin, Georgia, set up the oversized, throne-like homemade plywood armchair which would soon contain the considerable bulk of Edgar Martinez, otherwise known as Santa Claus or alternately, Santo Claus, to the children of the village of Amatista and the surrounding countryside. Mr. Martinez had been playing Santa in the dining room of the Birdcage Cafe for the past twenty years, back when both he and Juanita, the proprietress of the bird cage, were considerably younger and Edgar had been at least a hundred pounds lighter. That was according to Juanita. I don't see how Edgar can go on like this, said Juanita, surveying the modifications that Oliver, our handyman, had made to the massive painted plywood chair. If that boy gets any bigger, he won't be able to leave his house. That boy was pushing sixty, but since Juanita was nearly on the wrong side of seventy, I suppose that to her, Edgar probably did seem youthful. I had my own memories of Mr. Martinez playing Santa Claus. By the time the tradition had become established, I'd been a gangly teenager and far too dignified to think of sitting on Santa's knee and revealing my Christmas wishes, but I did have memories of the dining room of the bird cage being filled with squealing tots and their parents. I was pretty sure there was a picture of me and Georgia somewhere, standing stiffly on either side of Santa in front of the backdrop of the garish pink and green aluminum Christmas tree my uncle Ricky had acquired back in the sixties. The antique tree had been quietly retired not long after that picture of Georgia and me had been taken, but this year, while cleaning out one of the guest cottages behind the bird cage in hopes that it could be turned into a habitable abode for Georgia and her son Maxwell, we'd come across that prickly aluminum tree, and Maxwell had become enamored with the thing. This would be my first Christmas back at Little Tombstone, my extended family's run-down roadside tourist attraction, since my grandmother had passed away. It was strange for it to be just Georgia and me. We were all that was left of the family unless you counted Georgia's mother, Abigail, who wouldn't set foot on the place. It was going to fall to Georgia's precocious six-year-old son, Maxwell, to carry on the family line. It was just as I was trying to imagine Maxwell as a grown man with children of his own and failing entirely, that the boy of the hour appeared with Erp, my late Aunt Geraldine's ancient and irritable pug, in tow. My great Aunt Geraldine, Georgia's grandmother, had never allowed Erp to go around in the nude, and she would have heartily approved of Maxwell's enthusiasm for dressing the poor pug up each morning before breakfast in one of the many little doggy outfits she'd bequeathed to me along with the animal. This morning, Erp was costumed as a tiny elf, complete with hat, jacket, and little felt elf booties that made him pause and flick his back feet, first the right, then the left, every third step as he plodded across the worn floorboards of the dining room. Maxwell was dressed to match. Where did you find that elf costume, Maxwell? I asked. I found it in a box. We're going to be Santa's helpers. Maxwell was always finding things in boxes. In a place like Little Tombstone, with its rambling buildings complete with basements and attics, there was a lot of scope for indulging one's desire to collect things, which appeared to have been a major pastime of every inhabitant of Little Tombstone for the preceding sixty years. Who knew what we might find before we got the place set to rights, assuming that ever happened? Does Santa need helpers? I asked Maxwell. He nodded his head so vigorously that his elf hat tilted to one side. Mr. Martinez is a very experienced Santa, Georgia pointed out. I think he'll be fine on his own. Georgia was not the sort of mother who'd ever encouraged Maxwell to believe in the mythological, and, admittedly, Santa Claus was about as mythological as one could get. Even if Georgia had been the type to try and get her offspring to believe in the magic of Santa, it might not have worked. Maxwell's idea of light reading was the scientific American, and his favorite party trick was reciting the periodic table of elements backwards. 
I think you'd better ask Mr. Martinez first before assuming, Georgia told Maxwell. I'm not sure about involving Earp, I said. Poor Earp had flopped down underneath the aluminum tree and was trying to chew off one of his front booties, which was so securely velcroed around his ankle that all he'd succeeded in doing was getting a mouthful of slobbery felt fuzz. Emma. Earp wants to do it. Maxwell insisted. What if he bites someone? Earp doesn't bite. Earp didn't usually bite. He'd never bitten Maxwell, and he'd never bitten me. He had nipped Georgia, but that was only after she'd trod on him in the dark, so I considered that to be an understandable indiscretion due to extenuating circumstances. It was unlikely Earp would bite any of the kids who came to sit on Santa's knee, but it wouldn't at all surprise me if his discontented grumbling might not scare a few of them. Plus, there was the question of hygiene. Technically speaking, I said. Earp's not even supposed to be in here. Why not? Maxwell asked. I'm pretty sure that there are rules against having dogs inside restaurants. I was pretty sure there were rules against smoking cigars, too, but over at a table in the corner, Hank Edwards, curator of Little Tombstone's Museum of the Unexplained, was doing just that. As was his habit, Hank had turned over one of the little plastic no-smoking signs that Juanita put out in vain to remind her customers, Hank in particular, that smoking was not allowed. I expected that as soon as Santa arrived and the kiddies were unleashed in the dining room, Hank would make a hasty exit. Hank is not pro-kid, although you wouldn't know it by the way Maxwell peppered him with questions every time he saw him. Hank is also very much not pro-Christmas. In fact, at the curio shop next door, which is supposed to be a place Hank derives his livelihood from selling cheap faux southwestern tchotchkes to tourists, he'd made his feelings on Christmas quite clear. The dusty front windows of the shop were obscured with placards announcing that there were no Christmas items of any kind for sale and keep Christmas out of Amatista. I don't know what had led Hank to believe that anyone in the village or passing by would think the curio shop would be the prime location for doing any last-minute Christmas shopping, but Hank was obviously keen to keep the festively minded at arm's length. I don't know where Hank acquired his animosity toward Christmas in particular, but then there were any number of things Hank regarded with deep suspicion, the medical industrial complex, the truth about the death of JFK, and the insistence of the scientific community that aliens did not regularly visit our planet. Why is there a rule against dogs in restaurants? Maxwell asked me, and I was forced to suspend my observation of Hank just as he lit up his second cigar. Dogs aren't very clean creatures, I said. Erp is very clean, said Maxwell. He just had a bath last night. Erp had just had a bath. Somehow, Georgia and I had managed to suds up the pug and rinse him off in the apartment's only tiny bathroom. Erp was undoubtedly cleaner, but the bathroom wouldn't recover for a while. I gave up on the question of banning Erp from the premises. Instead, I went over to one of the front windows and cracked it open to let out the cigar smoke. Hopefully, Hank would finish his platter of bacon and eggs and his second cigar and leave before any asthmatic youngsters arrived to see Santa. Shouldn't Mr. Martinez be here by now? Georgia asked Juanita when she passed through the room to refill Hank's coffee and inform him that she'd added his breakfast to his running tab. I decided that Chamomile, the waitress, must be on her morning break. Yes, he should be here already, Juanita replied. Edgar is very reliable. It isn't like him at all to be late. Outside on the boardwalk, I could see that a few families were already lining up, according to instructions, to await their turn to come into the dining room to see Santa Claus. Hank might not be capable of obeying posted signage, but apparently, the younger set, eager to remain on Santa's nice list, wasn't having any trouble complying with protocol. I hope Edgar gets here soon, Juanita continued. It'll take him ten minutes just to get into his suit. She pointed at the size XXXL crimson crushed velour suit hanging over the back of a nearby chair. It was a good thing that Edgar always agreed to serve as Santa because there wasn't anybody else in the village who wouldn't look absolutely ridiculous in that suit. There weren't enough pillows to be had around Little Tombstone to make that suit fit an average man. We waited another ten minutes while the line grew outside. Juanita went back to the kitchen to put the finishing touches on the lunch special. Chamomile, the waitress, 
came back from her break and started making her rounds, refilling napkin dispensers and setting out condiment bottles. Hank finished his breakfast and left, leaving a lingering cloud of cigar smoke behind him. Juanita came out from the kitchen and said she tried to reach Edgar, but the call had gone to voicemail. What are we going to do? Georgia asked. We can't just send all those kids home. I think we're going to have to stall for time while we dig up a substitute Santa. Stall for time? How? Perhaps, this is Santa's elf helper's shining hour? I suggested. Emma. Georgia said. His mother might not have been in favor of it, but Maxwell was on the job. Before Georgia could express additional misgivings or define any parameters of what consisted of appropriate means of stalling for time, Maxwell was halfway out the door. Fortunately, he left Derp behind, and I took the opportunity to relieve the poor pug of his onerous felt booties. After I'd concealed the booties underneath the sparkly skirt of the aluminum Christmas tree, I addressed the question of acquiring a substitute Santa on such short notice. I'm going to see if I can talk Ledbetter into playing Santa, I told Georgia and bolted out the back door of the bird cage before she could weigh in on the idea. Ledbetter, one of our three tenants in the trailer court behind the bird cage, was tall enough to fit Edgar's costume, although, unlike Edgar, Ledbetter was a fitness buff and would require considerable padding to approximate anything approaching a traditional St. Nicholas physique. Marcus Ledbetter, who's a combat vet and suffers from PTSD, doesn't normally do crowds, but I was counting on the crowd being almost entirely juvenile, and him being sheltered behind a woolly white beard might be enough to make the experience tolerable for him. Ledbetter is a man of few words, but that didn't worry me. Santa doesn't have to say much. He just has to listen. I found Ledbetter out back, bundled up in a puffy parka and sitting with his eyes closed on a folding chair next to his trailer soaking up the mid-morning sunshine like an old cat. That you, Emma? he asked without opening his eyes. The man has the hearing of a Vulcan. How he knew it was me, I have no idea. We have a problem, I said. What's that? He opened his striking blue eyes and gave me an unblinking stare. A lot of people find Ledbetter intimidating, but I'm not one of them. Ledbetter is a gentle giant who wouldn't hurt a fly. In fact, he flat out refused to kill a bat once. But just because Ledbetter wasn't into killing wildlife didn't mean he was going to be easy to talk into playing St. Nicholas. Edgar Martinez hasn't shown up to play Santa, I said. Is that today? Yes, and there's a whole crowd of kids waiting outside of the bird cage to see St. Nicholas, but all we've got is an empty suit. I don't think Edgar's suit will be a very good fit, said Ledbetter. I don't think it will either, but you'll come closer to fitting it than anyone else. Surprisingly, it didn't take much persuasion to get Ledbetter to agree to play Santa. I ran back inside to collect Edgar's Santa suit, the hat with the flowing snowy white hair attached, and the curly beard. After collecting the costume, I went to the front door of the bird cage and peeked out through one of the cracked panes of glass in the front door to see how Maxwell was getting along with keeping the crowd entertained. I don't know what put the idea into Maxwell's head, it was as good as any I'd have come up with on such short notice but he decided that the ideal strategy for keeping the crowd happy was leading a sing-along of Christmas carols. When I say, Christmas carols, I'm using the phrase very loosely. At the moment I peeked my head out to see what was going on, the line of waiting parents and children were engaged in a rousing rendition of 99 pugs and an elf on a shelf modeled on the timeless and tasteless classic 99 bottles of beer on the wall. The waiting crowd was down to 78 pugs, the real pug having nearly fallen asleep on Maxwell the elf's feet after his exhausting struggle to divest himself of his little felt booties. I shouldn't have worried about his biting anyone. If Erp could sleep through Maxwell belting out a rendition of what must be the most irritating song on earth, he must be even deafer than I'd thought. I see you let Erp out, I said to Georgia as I passed back through the bird cage. Maxwell came back for him. Maxwell said Erp was an essential member of the cast. I'd better get this costume out back to Ledbetter, I said. He agreed. He did. I'm so relieved, said Georgia. Now, maybe things will go smoothly. Except they didn't. Things didn't go smoothly at all. 
Chapter 2 When Georgia had suggested that now that we had a substitute Santa, maybe the event would go smoothly, she couldn't have been more wrong, although, at first, it seemed that the event would be its usual success despite Edgar's unexpected absence. Out behind the bird cage, I stood on the gravel next to Ledbetter's trailer and helped him adjust every pillow I could scrounge up, trying to approximate Edgar's girth. It didn't look very realistic, but since it was Santa we were trying to impersonate, I didn't figure realism was terribly important. With the hat slash wig and the beard, Ledbetter made a rather respectable Santa, if you could get past the absence of a believable belly. The old-fashioned down pillows I'd stolen off the beds upstairs weren't a realistic substitute for adipose tissue. It's showtime. I told Ledbetter, and we went into the dining room of the bird cage. At first, things went smoothly. Erp flopped down next to Santa's plywood throne and fell asleep, despite the hubbub of the rapidly filling dining room. Maxwell flitted around, serving as crowd control. The children of Amatista, one by one, came up and whispered their dearest Christmas wishes into Santa's ear. When there were still about twenty kids left in line, Ledbetter signaled to me from across the room where I was chatting with Nancy, our town's mayor and rancher of the land that bordered the north boundary of Little Tombstone. What is it, Santa? I asked. Santa needs a potty break, Ledbetter whispered back. Are you sure you can't make it through another twenty kids? I asked. It was quite an ordeal getting all your pillows adjusted the first time. Whoever had constructed Edgar's Santa suit hadn't seen fit to put a fly into the crimson crushed velvet trousers. I imagined that Edgar, having years of experience, would have made it a point to think about such practical matters in advance. Unfortunately, in our haste to get Ledbetter costumed in his role as substitute Santa, neither of us had thought to prioritize one last trip to the bathroom before cinching up Santa's enormous brass buckled belt around his fake belly. Santa is about to burst, said Ledbetter. I can't make it through another twenty kids, especially not if any of them punch me in the abdomen like that last kid. He punched you? She. She punched you? She said my belly didn't shake like a bowl full of jelly, and I said it did, and then she punched me to prove I was wrong. She said I was wearing pillows. She wasn't wrong. No, but she was surprisingly strong for a five-year-old. The line of waiting children, held back by Maxwell's display of an improvised cardboard sign reading, Please wait here, was growing restive. Santa's taking a little break, I announced in my best authoritative voice. And anyone who hits Santa can expect coal in their stocking. What's coal? Asked a kid at the front of the line. I started to formulate an answer, but Maxwell beat me to it. Coal is a combustible sedimentary rock, Maxwell said, made up of carbon and other elements, chiefly hydrogen, sulfur, oxygen, and nitrogen. What? said the kid at the head of the line. It's a rock that burns, I told the kid. It's what troublemakers get in their stockings on Christmas morning instead of presents. I could see the mother who accompanied the boy at the head of the line pressing her lips together in disapproval of this loose talk of kids getting coal in their stockings. I didn't wait around to hear her objections to my tough love talk of punitive presents. All yours, Georgia, I said and went to lurk around the door of the men's room at the back of the bird cage so as to be on hand the second Ledbetter was ready for assistance in putting himself back together. I should have noticed that Erp had roused himself and followed me, but I didn't. Ledbetter peeked out the door, clutching an armful of pillows. I think I'm going to need help, he said. I'm on the job. I think the dish room is our best bet. It was as I was adjusting the single pillow across Ledbetter's back when I realized that we were not alone. I'd lain the spare pillows on a case of paper towels next to the dish sterilizer, and I turned to look when I heard a scrabbling against the cardboard. No, erp. I said as the pug managed to get the corner of an old down pillow in his teeth. No, erp, echoed Maxwell, who materialized in the doorway of the dish room. Mom wants to know how much longer. I never got a chance to answer. Erp, realizing that he was about to be deprived of the pillow, started dragging it away. I think he was heading back to his haunt next to the Christmas tree, but he never made it. Maxwell, zealous in his role as maintainer of order in Santa Land, caught Erp just as the pug re-entered the dining room, 
still clutching his prize. Don't tug on the pillow. I was about to warn Maxwell that the fabric on the old down pillow was fragile and would tear at the slightest provocation, but it was already too late. The down pillow ripped, spilling feathers everywhere, which excited Earp, who started tossing what was left of the case and its contents as if he'd just run down a rabbit and was attempting to break its neck. No, Earp. Maxwell yelled and sprang forward, scattering the innards of the pillow far and wide. It's snowing, yelled one of the kids, breaking out of the line to fan the billows of feathers. That was all it took for pandemonium to break out. There were kids everywhere, tossing feathers, kicking feathers, snorting feathers up their noses, and sneezing them back out. I scanned the crowd to find the anti coal mother. She looked like she'd sucked a sack of lemons, but all her disapproving looks weren't doing a thing to stop her own kid from taking a run and skidding across the floor on a slick of down. Ledbetter, who'd somehow managed to get himself sort of put back together, emerged from the back and yelled for order, but it made no difference. In fact, when he leaned over to try and reason with one kid who was throwing handfuls of feathers in the direction of the buffet that Juanita had recently put out in preparation for the lunch hour, another kid got Ledbetter in the face with his elbow. Santa's bleeding, a little girl screeched. Based on her level of hysteria, you'd have thought that Santa was hemorrhaging to death, but it turned out that Santa's bodily safety and general welfare were not her primary concern. We're all going to get coal in our stockings, she wailed. A couple of the smaller and more excitable kids started wailing along with her, I suppose out of a feeling that it seemed like the thing to do. Coal's not even a real thing, said a slightly older boy who'd been standing off to the side, brushing away any feathers that touched him. The kid spoke with the worldly sophistication that only an eight-year-old who is convinced he knows practically everything can pull off. Coal is, too, a real thing. Maxwell insisted. It was formed during the Carboniferous period. Everybody freeze. I heard a voice yell. I expected it to be Nancy Flynn since she had the natural authority that came with serving as mayor for a small community forever. But it wasn't Nancy yelling for order, it was Georgia. Nancy was nowhere to be seen, but Georgia was standing on Santa's throne, armed with a broom in one hand and a large plastic trash bag in the other. Santa, she ordered, go do something with your bloody nose. Everybody else, bring me a handful of feathers and put it in the trash bag. Anyone who leaves without picking up a handful of feathers. Don't say it, I said. There are already three kids crying because they think they're getting COAL in their stockings. Sometimes, I think Georgia forgets that Maxwell is not a usual child and that what's always worked with him isn't going to work with other people's children. Nevertheless, I applauded her quick thinking in requiring everyone to deposit a handful of feathers in the bag. Poor Juanita was never going to get to serve lunch at this rate. During the mayhem, which seemed to go on forever, but probably only lasted about three minutes, more diners had arrived to join the crowd of kids and parents still waiting to make their requests of St. Nicholas. Santa will be seeing the rest of the kids outside on the boardwalk, I said in a loud, firm voice. Line up at the door with your handful of feathers, and just as soon as Santa's gotten his nosebleed under control, he'll be outside on the steps. Then I collared Earp, who'd retreated behind the aluminum tree to be out of the way of the plundering hordes of preschoolers. I took him upstairs, then went back down to try and rid the dining room of feathers before someone lodged a complaint with the health department. Fortunately, early on in the proceedings, Juanita had had the foresight to put the lids back on the dishes that had already been placed on the buffet. Well, that was, interesting, said Georgia when we all finally collapsed upstairs in the apartment an hour later. How's Ledbetter? Ledbetter is fine, but I'm pretty sure that Edgar's going to want a new Santa beard. Chapter 3 After Juanita said she still hadn't been able to reach Edgar Martinez, I couldn't stop thinking about it. Edgar had faithfully shown up to play Santa Claus for the children of Amatista for the past twenty years, why had he suddenly gone missing? I decided that an investigation was in order. The day after the disastrous visit from Santa in the dining room of the Bird Cage Café, I decided to go looking for Edgar. I'd get to the bottom of his disappearance no matter what. I got Edgar's number from Juanita. I tried calling his phone three times. 
I didn't get any answer, and I wasn't expecting one. I'd also gotten Edgar's home address from Juanita. Well, not an address, per se. It was more a set of landmarks scribbled on the back of an order slip, but I was fairly confident that following them would take me out to the trailer where Edgar lived with his grown daughter and her children. I wanted to take someone with me before heading off onto a lonely road through the desert, but nobody seemed inclined to go. Georgia, who homeschools Maxwell in between engineering projects, which she does mostly from home, said she didn't have time to go gallivanting all over the desert looking for an AWOL St. Nick. She didn't say it in those exact words, but that was what she meant. Morticia, the resident psychic, who both lived and read tarot cards out of her ancient, hand-painted Winnebago parked out back in the trailer court, said she was fully booked. According to Morticia, the holidays were prime periods for people wanting to have their fortunes read. Do you get a lot of people wanting to know if their relatives are going to kill them over the Christmas dinner? I asked. Morticia didn't laugh. I couldn't decide if she didn't find my exaggeration funny because that was a question her clients actually asked or if she was just feeling a bit blue. At the best of times, Morticia is not what one would call chatty, so I let it go. I went next door and tried to talk Ledbetter into going out to Edgar's with me, but even though he'd probably have been willing to accompany me, he wasn't home. I briefly considered asking Hank but quickly ruled out the possibility. Hank would probably smoke cigars the whole way out to Edgar's, plus I wasn't up to feigning intense interest in whatever was his current pet conspiracy theory. I toyed with the idea of introducing the topic of chupacabras and letting him run with it, Hank's prize exhibit at the Museum of the Unexplained was a family of what he believed to be the only genuine example of taxidermied chupacabras in the Northern Hemisphere. My late grandmother and my great-aunt Geraldine had both insisted that the chupacabra family was simply the work of a talented and highly creative taxidermist. I was inclined to agree with them. After the fiasco of the day before, I lacked the strength to feign rapt interest in the feeding and breeding habits of the chupacabra, so I ruled out Hank as a companion on my search for Mr. Martinez. That left Oliver. I was loath to suggest that Oliver put off any one of the thousands of things around Little Tombstone that still needed doing, but I asked him anyway. Sure, he said. I'll go out there with you. Just let me put away my tools. How do you feel about driving Aunt Geraldine's old pickup? Sure, he said. Aunt Geraldine had left me a working vehicle, I was just too scared to drive it. The old pickup was temperamental and prone to fits of obstinance. I wasn't confident I could even get the old thing started. Straight after Christmas, I intended to buy a reliable car and leave the old pickup to Oliver's sole use for trips up to Santa Fe to buy building supplies. Twenty minutes later, Oliver and I were out on Highway 41 in Aunt Geraldine's old heap, scanning the sides of the road for the first landmark. According to Juanita's directions, we were to turn off on an unmarked dirt road just after we passed by a collection of three large boulders. I think those are the boulders, I said, pointing off to the side. Oliver was doubtful. As he pointed out, there were boulders all over the place. Well, let's still keep an eye out for an old hubcap wired to a barbed wire fence. It turned out I was right. We turned at the old hubcap, continued on until we crossed a dry arroyo, turned left at a row of three mailboxes, and went on for half a mile over a rocky, rutted track until we came to a lonely trailer sitting in the middle of the saguaros and sagebrush. Oliver pulled up a little way away, and we got out and navigated the toy-strewn dirt yard in front of the trailer to get to the front door. I knocked on the thin metal door and waited for someone to answer. Inside I could hear the sound of a kid's cartoon playing on the television and a woman's voice admonishing someone to stop running in the house and that there was food in the kitchen and if anyone was hungry, they'd better come and get it. I wondered how many kids Edgar's daughter had. Even without being able to see the scene inside, I could tell she had her hands full. I knocked again, louder this time. A few seconds later, the door was flung open by a small girl clutching a chicken nugget in one hand and swinging a barbie by the hair with the other. A smear of ketchup decorated one chubby cheek. Is your grandfather home? I asked her. No, the girl said. He's in Mexico. Mexico? That was quick. Is your mother home, then? 
I asked. Mama, the little girl hollered. I wasn't sure that the lady of the house even knew there were visitors, and the startled look she gave us when she came to the door confirmed my suspicions. Either the small girl, who'd belatedly informed me that her name was Marisol, was naturally fearless, or they lived so far out in the sticks that her mother hadn't felt it necessary to teach her about stranger danger. I'm Emma Iverson, I said, extending my hand to the frazzled woman. From Little Tombstone. I'm Geraldine Montgomery's niece. Oh, the woman said. This information didn't seem to mean much to her. My grandmother was Juanita's best friend, I said. The woman's face lit up. It seemed any granddaughter of a friend of Juanita's was a friend of the family. I came to check on your dad, I continued. We were worried because he didn't show up at the bird cage to be Santa Claus yesterday, and Juanita couldn't reach him. My father didn't call? No and every time any of us have tried to call, it went straight to voicemail. I think he left his phone here, the woman said. That's why. Your little girl said your father went to Mexico. Yes, it was a last-minute decision. My great-aunt is sick. When did he leave? I'm not sure, Edgar's daughter said. He sent me a text yesterday evening, saying he'd gone to Mexico. I thought he left his phone here. He did. He sent it from someone else's. One of my cousins probably. He texted you from Mexico. Yeah. Edgar's daughter, whose name was Sochal, invited us in for lunch, but since neither Oliver and I were in the mood for chicken nuggets, and I suspected there were already not quite enough to go around, I declined. I hope your great-aunt recovers, I told Sochal. I'm really sorry about my dad not showing up like that, she said. He loves playing Santa. He looks forward to it every year. He must have been so worried about his aunt that he forgot all about it. I guess your dad didn't drive himself to the airport? I asked Sochal, inclining my head toward the big Chevy pickup with a fold-down step on the driver's side. The vanity plates said ED followed by the Zia sun symbol and the letters JAR. My uncle Jose probably took him, she said. He lives in Amatista. I wanted to ask if Edgar had left home so quickly that he'd neglected to even pack a bag, but that was also a question I couldn't bring myself to ask. Or maybe Sherry took Dad to the airport, Sochal added as an afterthought. Sherry? Dad's girlfriend. Something was off, but I didn't think it had anything to do with Sochal. If she'd been a bit less overwhelmed, she might be feeling as uneasy as I was. I think we'd better have a chat with this brother of Edgar's before we go home, I told Oliver as we pulled back out onto Highway 41. Edgar probably just forgot, said Oliver. He was probably just worried about his aunt and forgot about everything else. Probably, I said. But I wasn't so sure. I called Juanita and found out where Edgar's brother Jose lived. I was certain I had the right house, even though there weren't house numbers in the village of Amatista, Juanita's instructions had been unmistakable. Jose Martinez lived in a yellow house with green trim, and there was a collection of yellow painted tires with prickly pears planted in them rode up outside the front fence. When we got there, Oliver parked across the unpaved street. He'd already been witness to one of my unfortunate tangles with cactus. It seemed he was not eager to repeat the experience. When I knocked, no one answered. It seemed that no one was home. I retreated from the tiny front porch to the street and called up Juanita for the third time that morning. It was the middle of the lunch rush, and I could hear the buzz of the packed dining room and the rattling of dishes in the background. Do you know where Edgar's girlfriend lives? I asked Juanita. Sherry? Does Edgar have more than one girlfriend? No, no, that's not what I meant. He and Sherry have been together for ages. They'd have combined households long ago, but Edgar has his daughter and her kids living with him, and Sherry takes care of her elderly father. Interesting information, but not what I was looking for. Where does Sherry live? I repeated. Right next to the post office, Juanita told me. It's her parents' old house. Look for an adobe with a bunch of wind chimes hanging from the tree out front. I had expected Juanita to ask how my search for Edgar was going, 
but evidently, she was too swamped with mouths to feed to worry herself about missing Santa's. At Sherry's house, I got better results. Oliver stayed in the truck, and I went up to the door and knocked. A woman in her early sixties answered the door, and I held out my hand. I'm Emma, I told her, from Little Tombstone. I was just stopping by to check on Edgar. The woman told me she was Sherry, although she didn't elaborate on the nature of her relationship with Edgar. I suppose that she assumed I already knew. He doesn't live here, said Sherry. Did you try his house? He wasn't there, I said. His daughter hasn't seen him since the day before yesterday. There was nothing furtive or suspicious in Sherry's manner, so I don't know what stopped me from telling Sherry that Sochal believed Edgar was in Mexico visiting his sick aunt. I guess I just wanted to see if Sherry would tell me the same thing. She didn't. He's in Phoenix, Sherry said without a trace of hesitation. I'm surprised he didn't tell Sochal where he was going. Phoenix? He has a nephew living there, and this nephew's wife was in a car accident, so Edgar went up there to help out with their kids for a few days until the wife's mother gets there. That was a dizzying dump of information and bore no resemblance to the story Sochal had told me. I decided not to confront Sherry with Sochal's conflicting account just yet. I'd wait until I'd had a chance to speak with Edgar's brother Jose. We were just worried, I told Sherry, and thought somebody ought to check on him. He didn't show up to play Santa Claus yesterday at the bird cage, so we wondered if something might not be wrong. He didn't call you? Sherry asked. Sochal said he left his phone behind. He does that a lot, Sherry said, completely unconcerned. Even when he has it with him, he usually doesn't turn it on. Has he called you since he went to Phoenix? I asked. No, Sherry said. He let me know he was going before he left. In person? Yes. Sherry was starting to look at me strangely, and I couldn't blame her. I was asking too many questions. Well, if you hear from him again, I said, can you ask him to call Juanita at the bird cage? She's worried. That wasn't entirely true. If anyone was worried, it was me. A man known to be a rock of reliability disappears, and his nearest and dearest offer up differing accounts on where he's gone to, I couldn't help worrying. Something had to be wrong, I just hadn't the foggiest what it was. Chapter 4 After I left Sherry's, I had Oliver drive by Jose's again, but since dusk was falling and the lights in the house were still off, I assumed that no one was at home. Edgar lied to either his daughter or his girlfriend, I said to Oliver as we drove the short three blocks back to Little Tombstone. Or maybe one of them is lying to you, Oliver pointed out. That was a distinct possibility. Someone was definitely lying to somebody, but why? For the rest of the evening, I didn't have time to worry about where Edgar Martinez had disappeared to because Maxwell had big plans for celebrating Christmas, and he was dead set on involving us all in the preparations for the festivities to come. Maxwell, who homeschools and therefore has considerable leeway to pursue any areas of particular interest, had recently become fascinated with the medieval period. When his input was solicited on what our family Christmas plans should be, he'd immediately struck upon the idea that we should celebrate Christmas just as people had in the Middle Ages. I'm not sure what you mean, said Georgia. Are you suggesting that we strew the floor with straw and give up indoor plumbing for the day? The suggestion of spreading straw on the floor was met with enthusiasm, but Maxwell was less eager to pursue authenticity to the point of barricading the bathroom and declaring it off-limits. We must have a boar's head, said Maxwell. And mead. Why a boar's head? I couldn't help asking. It's traditional. That was Maxwell's answer to every objection lodged by Georgia or me as to the impracticality of some of his suggestions. In the end, it was decided that we would have a feast that blended the old and the new. Maxwell would get his boar's head, which Georgia would fashion out of a large roast and various root vegetables, and I would get my cranberry sauce and sweet potatoes. I'll organize why ye old Christmas revels, Maxwell said. Ye old? I asked. Why ye old is what they called things in medieval times. Is it? I wasn't so sure about that, but Maxwell was adamant. So, 
If I refer to my tablet as why ye old iPad, it's medieval? Maxwell didn't dignify my suggestion with a reply. Well, there's no need to go overboard with why ye old Christmas revels, his mother warned Maxwell. It'll just be the three of us and maybe a few of the people from the trailer court. I didn't know it yet, of course, having only recently reacquainted myself with the kid, but going overboard was Maxwell's specialty. The next morning, bright and early, I trudged through the frosty air from Little Tombstone to Road Runner Lane, where Jose's little yellow and green house sat, hopefully, occupied this time. I was in luck. Within seconds of knocking on the door, it was opened by an aggressively cheerful woman who wished me, a bit prematurely, I thought, Merry Christmas and immediately yelled at someone in the background to turn down the TV. We got company, she yelled. Then called for Jose. For the first time, I noticed that her wide smile did not quite reach her eyes. She also didn't open the door very wide. Instead of either inviting me in or remaining in the doorway herself, she came outside onto the porch in her sock feet and stood shivering in the frosty air. Are you sure you don't want some slippers? I asked. I was about to suggest a coat, as well, when she wrenched open the front door and dove inside. She came back out with Rudolph the reindeer slippers on her feet, but an even less convincingly cheerful look on her face. The woman, who informed me her name was Dottie after I'd introduced myself, was about the shortest grown woman I'd ever seen. If she was Jose's wife, and he in any way took after his enormous brother, they must make quite a comical pair. I decided that Jose must be huge. I'd caught a glimpse of a ginormous pair of men's Velcro closure old man style sneakers setting just inside the door. Just as I was starting to explain why I was knocking on Dottie and Jose's door at the ungodly hour of seven in the morning, Jose came out and joined us on the porch. Those ginormous shoes definitely did not belong to him. It wasn't that he was a small man, he was just very average. I was starting to tell your wife that I'm here to check on your brother, Edgar, I said. He was supposed to play Santa at Little Tombstone yesterday, but he never showed up or even called. When I went to check on him at his house, his daughter seemed to think he'd made a sudden unplanned trip to Mexico to see your ill aunt. I scanned Jose and Dottie's faces as I spoke, hoping for some reaction. I didn't get much of one. They both nodded but didn't confirm or deny the accuracy of Sochal's statement that Edgar had gone off to Mexico to see his aunt. The strange thing is, I continued, I stopped by afterward to check with Sherry, and she seems to think Edgar is in Phoenix with his nephew. Oh, said Jose. That is strange, said Dottie, but she didn't look convincingly shocked by this revelation. Have you heard from Edgar in the past couple of days? I asked point blank. Oh, yes, said Dottie. Jose was the one who called Edgar and told him that their aunt was in the hospital. The hospitalization part was a new wrinkle. There was nothing inherently unbelievable about a woman who must be at least in her eighties being unexpectedly admitted to the hospital, but for some reason, I wasn't buying it. I think Sherry must have just misunderstood, said Jose. Probably Edgar had made plans to go to Phoenix before he found out our aunt was sick. Jose lived with our aunt for a while when he was young, so of course, he'd change his plans. So, Edgar really is in Mexico visiting your aunt? Yes, Jose insisted. Perhaps he had made plans to go to Phoenix before he found out our aunt was sick. I do hope your aunt is feeling better now, I said. What's wrong with her? It was a nosy question, but I couldn't help asking it. Dottie and Jose looked at each other like you do when you get to a doorway at the same second as a complete stranger, and you give each other the, you go first, face. Cancer, said Jose at the exact same time Dottie said, broke her hip. I stood there and looked at them both, waiting for them to get their stories straight. Bone cancer, said Dottie looking absolutely rattled. The cancer made her bones weak. They found the cancer when she broke her hip. Jose stood by nodding, looking equally rattled. I suppose that cancer could conceivably weaken one's bones and cause a fracture, but I was quite certain this was not what had recently happened to Edgar and Jose's aunt. Jose and Dottie were lying to me. Unlike Sochal and Sherry, who I assumed believed they were telling the truth, Jose and Dottie were lying through their teeth. 
The big question was, why? Chapter 5 I left Jose and Dottie's without any logical explanation to the conflicting tales of what Edgar was currently up to. To add to my consternation, while I was sitting at a table in the bird cage waiting for chamomile to bring me out a plate of migas and a glass of orange juice, Juanita came out of the kitchen to inform me that she'd heard from Edgar herself. Edgar called me this morning, she said. He wanted to apologize for leaving us high and dry without a Santa. Did Edgar say where he was calling from? I asked. No, but I assume he was calling from Mexico. He said he'd gone down there because his aunt was in the hospital. Did he happen to say what was wrong with her? I asked. He said she had a heart attack. Are you absolutely sure that's what he said? Yes, I knew she'd had trouble with her heart for years. I asked Edgar if she'd had another heart attack, and he said, yes. That's very odd because Jose seemed to think that their aunt broke her hip because she was riddled with bone cancer. Juanita looked bemused but far less alarmed than I felt. Something fell to the floor in the kitchen, and she scurried off to see what was amiss, leaving me more concerned than ever. Had it even been Edgar on the other end of the line? I went back into the kitchen to ask Juanita one final question. You don't think someone in Edgar's family might be holding him against his will, do you? Juanita started laughing so hard she dropped the ladle she was using to stir the pot of masa on the stove and lost it underneath the bubbling surface of the cooking corn flour. Oh, Emma, she said when she'd stopped laughing. Edgar is the kind who would give you the shirt off his back, and the rest of the family is no different. Then how do you explain Edgar not showing up to play Santa Claus? He found out his aunt was going into the hospital and forgot all about letting us know he wasn't going to make it. If his aunt really is in the hospital, I said. Don't you think all those conflicting stories are more than a little strange? There aren't two members of the family who tell the exact same story. Juanita admitted that it was, indeed, a little strange. I'm sure there's some perfectly harmless explanation for, she broke off. For all the lying? I wouldn't put it quite like that, she protested, unwilling to malign the whole Martinez family. How would you put it? Maybe, they are just trying to protect Edgar's privacy, she suggested. This wasn't the first time, nor would it be the last, that Juanita had not gently admonished me to mind my own business. Juanita could admonish all she wanted, but she couldn't keep me from continuing to wonder what had actually happened to Edgar. I wasn't going to be able to rest easy until I saw Amatista's favorite Santa Claus in the flesh. I was also starting to wonder if Edgar might not be in either Phoenix or in Mexico. Those size 16W shoes sitting inside the doorway at Jose and Dottie's had me suspicious. There were very few people around who could fit shoes like that. Not even Ledbetter needed shoes that big. I decided to take drastic measures. I was going to case Jose and Dottie's house and see what I could see. If Edgar was in that house, hopefully, alive and well, I wanted to confirm the fact for myself. It seemed to me, not being an expert in covert surveillance, that the best time to observe the comings and goings from Jose and Dottie's would be under the cover of darkness. However, that evening, conducting covert surveillance was out of the question. Georgia, Maxwell, and I had tickets to see a Christmas carol in Santa Fe. Georgia and I had seen the play before, but it was Maxwell's first time experiencing the magic of a live theater production, and he was entranced from the first scene. What was your favorite part? I asked him as we drove back to Little Tombstone after the performance. I liked when Scrooge called the ghost a piece of cheese and a raw potato. At the time, I had my doubts about the accuracy of Maxwell's memory, but later on, I looked it up on the internet. The exact lines were. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of underdone potato. There's more of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. I expected, and my expectations were eventually borne out, that we'd be hearing far more such lines from the performance before Maxwell's newfound enthusiasm for the theater died down. Chapter 6 Over breakfast the morning after our outing to see a Christmas carol, I informed Georgia that I intended to do a little covert surveillance of Jose and Dottie Martinez's house right after supper that evening. Is that really necessary? 
Georgia protested in a low voice as she spooned out poached eggs, fried tomatoes, and bacon onto our plates in three equal parts. You said that Juanita is willing to vouch for the whole family. Maxwell was in the bathroom. He was supposed to be washing his hands, but instead, he was regaling Earp with a rundown of the plot of the play we'd seen the evening before. It seemed that the pug was not displaying sufficient interest because Maxwell's description of the ghost of Christmas past was being punctuated by admonitions to Earp to pay attention. Sometimes, I told Georgia, Juanita is inclined to take on a far too sunny view of human nature. Perhaps she does, but has she ever actually been wrong about any one individual? We're not talking about an individual. The entire Martinez family seems profoundly confused as to the whereabouts of Edgar. Georgia shrugged and declined to continue arguing with me. At least take someone with you, she said. I thought you were willing to take Juanita at her word when she vouched for the Martinez family. Well, you never know who else is wandering around out there in the dark. I suppose that was true, and just then, Maxwell emerged from the bathroom, erp in tow. I dropped the subject of Edgar's mysterious disappearance. After breakfast, I went looking for Ledbetter. I found him pumping iron on the weight bench he keeps on the empty concrete pad next to his trailer. I'm going to check on Edgar's brother and his wife this evening after supper, I told Ledbetter. Check on. Okay, I admitted, I'm going to spy on them. Why? I filled Ledbetter in on the latest developments. He was less impressed than I had hoped. Don't you think it might be wise to defer to Juanita's judgment on this one? he asked. What does it hurt to park across the street from the house and watch who comes and goes? Put like that, Ledbetter couldn't come up with any serious objections. Why do you need me? he asked. Because I want to sit across the street inside the cab of Aunt Geraldine's old pickup, and I can't even get the thing started. Ledbetter was not enthusiastic, but after I bribed him with a tin of George's Christmas gingerbread cookie men, he reluctantly agreed to meet me where Oliver had last parked the old pickup at six that evening. Six was a little early, but I didn't want to miss anything. When I got to the gravel parking strip back of the old motel that evening, Ledbetter was already waiting. He'd gotten the old pickup started and was letting the engine warm up. I hoped he had the heater going. I'd come prepared for the eventuality of having to sit in the front of the old pickup for hours. Here, I said, as I handed Ledbetter a couple of instant hand warmers. Is that coffee? Ledbetter asked, pointing to the oversized vintage 1970s thermos I'd discovered under the kitchen sink in the apartment I'd inherited from Aunt Geraldine. No, I remembered that you don't drink coffee. It's cocoa. Are you sure this is a good idea? Ledbetter said after I'd clambered up onto the old bench seat and hauled the door shut using both hands. What can it hurt? Sometimes, people do things that don't make sense to outsiders who don't know the whole story. I was pretty sure Ledbetter was talking about himself. Ledbetter has more secrets than a former member of the National Security Council. It took about two minutes to get over to Jose and Dottie's house. When we arrived, the windows were dark. I don't think anyone is at home. Want some cocoa? I asked to forestall any inquiries into how long I could be expected to persist in sitting in the cold outside a deserted house. Why don't we save it for when it gets cold in here? It got cold in the cab in about ten minutes. I was just about to revisit the idea of breaking open the thermos of cocoa when a minivan pulled up in front of Jose and Dottie's house. Is that Jose? I asked Ledbetter as we watched a man get out of the driver's side and go around to the side door and slide it open. I think so. Dottie got out of the front passenger seat and went to stood at the open side door. That's Edgar in there. I said. It couldn't be anyone else. The dome light in the minivan didn't give out a great deal of light, but in the darkened alley devoid of streetlights, it might as well have been a 500-watt spotlight trained right at Edgar's head. I guess Edgar isn't really in Mexico, said Ledbetter. Or Phoenix. Unless Edgar had just gotten back from one of those locations, but that seemed unlikely. A man of Edgar's size would not be able to extricate himself from a vehicle with speed and grace even on a good day, 
but this evening Edgar seemed to be having more trouble than I would have anticipated getting out of the minivan. I think he's in pain, I said. I think so, too. Why would he be in pain? That looks like a hospital band on his wrist. Ledbetter was right. Now that we've seen that Edgar is alive and in good hands, Ledbetter continued, can we leave him in peace? I was tempted to spring from the passenger side of the old pickup and demand an explanation on the spot, but I decided against it. Something was wrong with Edgar, that was for sure, but I had no reason to believe that he was in any danger of further injury. Juanita had sworn that the Martinez family could be trusted to look out for their own. For this evening, anyway, I was going to allow them to get on with the task undisturbed. Chapter 7 The morning of Christmas Eve, Maxwell was up at the crack of dawn. Because Maxwell was up, so was Earp. I heard pellets of dry food hitting Earp's dish and surmised that Maxwell was, according to my instructions, measuring out Earp's diet dog food. Suitable for senior dogs, the bag claimed. Maxwell was meticulous about not dispensing any more or less than the measuring cup I'd left in the tub containing the dog food. Maxwell's conscientiousness concerning Earp's calorie intake was considerably undermined by the fact that after the pugs precisely measured therapeutic breakfast, he would spend the rest of the day at Maxwell's heels, waiting for the kid to drop, sometimes by accident and sometimes on purpose, portions of the snacks he never seemed to be without. There was a very real danger that poor Earp might soon outgrow a few of the snugger fitting of the doggy costumes in his extensive canine wardrobe. A few minutes after I heard Earp's food being poured out into his bowl, I heard the pug grumbling, followed by solemn admonitions from Maxwell to stay still and cooperate, and decided that the poor pug must be undergoing his wardrobe change. When I emerged from my room somewhat bleary-eyed, I was greeted by Earp dressed as a Christmas angel complete with fairy light halo. If there was ever a case of misgasting, this must be it, I told Maxwell. What? Never mind. Is your mother up? No, and she says anybody who wakes her up will be sorry. I was pretty sure that Georgia was very much awake already. Put a leash on Erp, and I'll take him out back to do his business. While Erp was doing his business and I was shivering in the cold, Juanita came out the back door of the bird cage to say good morning. It's Christmas Eve, I said. I thought you weren't opening today. I'm not opening today, Juanita said. I'm using the kitchen to finish up our family Christmas dinner. I'm doing two 30-pound turkeys this year. Juanita has a big family, and although I'd never been invited to one of her family Christmas dinners, I imagined that everyone had to be removed from the premises with a forklift afterwards. Our own Christmas dinner, which was, fortunately, being mostly prepared by Georgia with me in a purely supplementary role, would be far less abundant a feast than what Juanita's family was getting, but I was still looking forward to it. I was even looking forward to whatever it was that Maxwell had planned as after-dinner entertainment. The previous day, Maxwell had distributed handmade invitations to all and sundry inviting them to Y.E. Old Christmas Revels and gotten several takers. Georgia and I decided that we'd better hold Christmas dinner in the dining room of the bird cage rather than trying to shoehorn everyone into our tiny apartment upstairs. Oliver would be there and led better. Katie the mail carrier and chamomile would also attend. Morticia would be spending Christmas with her mother in Santa Fe. Hank's uncharacteristically polite refusal of Maxwell's earnest invitation had been a setback. Hank declined to divulge his plans, but apparently, he would be spending Christmas Day elsewhere. Still, there would be seven of us at the Christmas table, and I trusted it would be a far more festive experience than my usual excruciating dinners with my soon-to-be ex-husband's parents. I saw Edgar yesterday, said Juanita, completely obliterating my internal debate on the competing merits of whole versus jellied cranberry sauce and wondering if Georgia had remembered to buy eggnog. Maxell might be satisfied with mead masquerading as apple juice mixed with ginger ale, but I wanted a cup of eggnog to complete my Christmas dinner. You saw Edgar? I practically yelped when Juanita revealed that she'd seen the man in the flesh. I'd seen Edgar, too, but I was loath to admit it. Yes, he was very apologetic about not showing up to play Santa. So, Edgar really wasn't in Mexico? No. Or Phoenix? No. Juanita is the sweetest woman on earth, 
but every once in a while, she can't resist the urge to teach me a lesson. I knew Juanita would get around to telling me everything I wanted to know eventually, but in the meantime, she was going to make me squirm a little in what I considered a misguided attempt to teach me patience and to keep my nose out of other people's business. Where was Edgar? I asked. He was in the hospital in Albuquerque. I'd already gathered he'd been in the hospital somewhere based on the band I'd glimpsed around his wrist. Had he suddenly collapsed on the day he'd promised to play Santa and told no one about it but his brother? Why was Edgar in the hospital? If I tell you everything, you have to promise not to breathe a word of what I'm about to tell you to anyone, Juanita insisted. Why not? I don't want to ruin the surprise. What surprise? Who is going to be surprised? Edgar had lap band surgery. He didn't want Sochal or Sherry to worry about him. I guess they were both already pretty worried about his health since he's put on so much weight, but the surgery itself is a little risky. Oh. Edgar is hoping to surprise them with his weight loss in a few weeks. By then. Surely, the surgery was scheduled far in advance. Why did Edgar flake out on playing Santa? There was a last-minute opening in the surgeon's schedule, said Juanita. Edgar was so excited about getting in for the surgery that he completely forgot he was supposed to be at the bird cage to play Santa. But why the conflicting stories? Surely, Edgar should have told his daughter and his girlfriend the same thing. Isn't there a danger that they'll compare notes? I guess Edgar told Sherry one thing in person before he went to the hospital. While Edgar was in recovery, Jose took it upon himself to text Sochal from someone else's phone so she wouldn't worry when her father didn't come home that evening. Unfortunately, in all the excitement, Edgar and Jose didn't do a very good job of matching up their stories. What happens when Sherry and Sochal talk to each other? Jose took care of that. How? Juanita said she didn't know, but she was sure everything would work out fine in the end. I told you nothing sinister was going on, she said. She left off the part where she pointed out that I should have believed her, but she might as well have gone ahead and said it. I can't help it, I said. I know, said Juanita. You have a good heart. It wasn't like you wanted anything bad to have happened to Edgar. You were just worried. I had been worried, but now I wasn't. I had my first Christmas back at Little Tombstone to look forward to, and I intended to enjoy it every bit as much as I had those childhood Christmases back when my grandmother and great Aunt Geraldine had still been with us. I think they'd be pleased, I told Juanita. I think they would, too. She didn't have to ask who I meant. Merry Christmas, Juanita, I said. Merry Christmas, Emma, Juanita said back and proceeded to squeeze the stuffing out of me. Why are you crying? Maxwell asked when I met him halfway up the stairs. I was carrying Earp, who'd eyed devast of his little angel wings and halo before letting him loose to answer the call of nature. It seemed cruel to expect him to wear such a humiliating get-up while relieving himself. Earp. I told you to leave your costume alone, Maxwell admonished. You're the main angel. Am I to expect an entire angel choir to burst on the scene at any moment? I asked. I'm sorry, I misspoke. I meant to ask if I was to expect an entire choir of Y.E. old angels to burst on the scene at any moment. Maxwell refused to say a word. Despite his initial verbosity regarding our medieval Christmas feast, he'd clammed up as to what we might expect as after-dinner entertainment. The Christmas dinner menu, I suspected, was not a secret due largely to the fact that Maxwell was not allowed loose in the kitchen without supervision. After balking at both the bizarre nature of Maxwell's more unconventional ideas regarding Christmas dinner and making practical objections to the proposed execution of several of Maxwell's requests, Georgia had entered into the spirit of the medieval Christmas feast with surprising enthusiasm. When Maxwell and I arrived back upstairs, the kitchen table was covered with the components of what would become the boar's head. Why ye old boar's head, Maxwell had insisted, was essential. Georgia was absently spooning soggy cornflakes out of a bowl and into her mouth with one hand while making minor adjustments to the snout carved into an enormous pot roast with the other. What are these? I asked, picking up two slivers of raw turnip from the table. Don't touch anything, said Georgia. 
I spent 15 minutes getting those tusks just right. Sorry, I said. I'll leave the artist to work in peace. Breakfast is every man for himself, Georgia snapped and went back to working on the snout. Creativity sure makes some people crabby, I said under my breath. What? Maxwell asked. I heard that, said Georgia. Shall I make us some eggs? I asked. You know how to make eggs? Maxwell looked very skeptical. In the short time we'd lived together, I hadn't cooked once. I'm not a very good cook, I told Maxwell, but I think I can manage to scramble some eggs. The eggs weren't as good as George's, and there was no bacon to go with them, but they were edible. Behold, I bring you tidings of Y.E. Old Scrambled Eggs. I announced. Georgia went on inserting prunes into the eye sockets she'd carved into either side of the boar's head. We'd better eat without her, I told Maxwell. I think your mother is in the clutches of her muse. She's in the clutches of a moose? Maxwell looked at me like I was slightly off my rocker. A muse borscht, said Georgia. You never can tell when she's just pretending not to listen. What? said Maxwell. I think your mother is proposing we add miniature servings of beet soup to the menu, most likely preceding the main course. Why ye old beet soup, said Georgia. You ladies are weird, said Maxwell as if he wasn't the one who'd started the whole why ye old thing in the first place. The rest of the day was consumed with preparations for why ye old Christmas revels. With the dining room of the bird cage dark and devoid of its usual crush of famished villagers, Maxwell had the freedom to indulge the full scope of his creative inclinations. Almost. Georgia put her foot down at strewing the floor with straw. But you suggested it, Maxwell protested. I did not suggest it. I merely brought up the concept. I'm not in favor of straw, either, I said. We've just now divested the dining room of down from Earp's unfortunate scrap with the pillow, but just out of curiosity, where were you proposing to procure this straw to strew on the floor? I asked Miss Flynn for some, said Maxwell. It's sitting out behind the back door. I went to the back door and looked out. Sure enough, there was the bale of straw, as promised. What did you tell Miss Flynn you needed straw for? I asked. I told her it was for Y.E. Old Christmas Revels. And she didn't ask any questions? No. I would have supposed that if a six-year-old requested a complimentary bale of straw from her ranch supplies to incorporate into an event described as Y.E. Old Christmas Revels, Nancy would ask more questions, but apparently not. By supper time on Christmas Eve, the dinner menu was prepared to Georgia's satisfaction and the venue to Maxwell's. Throughout the proceedings, Herb had looked on at the harried activities of the humans with a jaundiced eye, but his gloomy demeanor might simply have been the result of being stuffed into a Christmas tree green sequin jacket with a matching faux fur Santa hat that was slightly too big and kept sliding down over his eyes. What's up going to be dressed up as for Y.E. Old Christmas Revels? I asked Maxwell. Health department regulations or no, I knew any suggestion that Earp should remain upstairs snoring in his bed in the corner of the kitchen would be unthinkable to Maxwell. It's a surprise, said Maxwell. Tomorrow, you'll see. Chapter 8 Christmas morning dawned cold and bright. I was awakened by the sound of Earp's breakfast of diet kibble hitting his dish and Maxwell's stage whispering that they must be very, very quiet. The kid was making more noise than the canine. After Maxwell had fallen asleep the night before, Georgia and I had hung a row of stockings from the curtain rod in the living room. There was no chimney for Santa to come down, but since Maxwell was fully aware of who procured and stuffed the stockings, it didn't matter. Georgia and I emerged from our rooms at the same time. Merry Christmas, I said. Georgia just nodded. She's not at her best first thing in the morning. When I came into the living room, I realized that someone had made an addition to the row of stockings hanging from the curtain rod. A small boy's tube sock, helpfully labeled with permanent marker as belonging to Earp, had been safety pinned to the curtain. Even as attached as my late Aunt Geraldine had been to her pug, I doubted that Earp had ever gotten his own stocking. Shall we open our stockings? I said. I'll get them down. Youngest first, said Georgia. 
That was Maxwell, obviously. He received a pair of miniature binoculars from Georgia and an Einstein t-shirt from me that said intelligence is not knowledge but imagination. I think Earp's next, I said after Maxwell had gone to the window and squinted through his binoculars at the deserted highway out front of the bird cage and then attempted to get Earp to model the Einstein t-shirt since in the excitement of opening the Christmas stockings Earp had not yet been outfitted for the day. Maxwell undid the safety pin tube sock and plopped it down in front of Earp, who sniffed at it with enthusiasm, then started destroying the sock to get to whatever was inside. You'd better help him, Georgia told Maxwell. Earp's present turned out to be a flavored rawhide chew that Maxwell had purchased during the Christmas shopping he'd done under the supervision of his grandmother, Abigail, before she jetted off to spend Christmas in the tropics. Georgia and I were only a few months apart in age, so I suggested that she dig into her stocking first. She pulled out a pair of fluffy blue mittens, from Maxwell, and a desert-themed charm bracelet, from me. I bought that at Hank's curio shop, I told her. I don't believe it, she said, turning it over. It's sterling silver. So, Hank informed me, I said. I spotted it in one of his display cases under a pile of dusty souvenir spoons. It looks like it's been there since the sixties. Seems very likely. I didn't tell him it was intended as a Christmas gift, or he might have refused to sell it to me. Very wise, said Georgia. I love it. My stocking had an odd lumpy look to it. I hefted it in my hand. Did someone give me combustible sedimentary rocks with high amounts of carbon and hydrocarbons? Maxwell insisted that I'd gotten it all wrong. I did not deserve coal in my stocking. When I pulled out my presents, the lumps turned out to be a string of little clay pots tied together with a rope. Is this from you? I asked Maxwell. Yes, I bought it from Mr. Edwards. I figured Maxwell and I must have doubled Hank's average weekly revenue just by doing a little covert Christmas shopping. Georgia had gifted me a hand-painted silk scarf she'd bought from a gallery in Santa Fe. I wrapped the scarf around my neck, and we ate an unsubstantial breakfast so as to have plenty of capacity for the upcoming Christmas revels to commence in the dining room of the bird cage at 2 p.m. on the dot. Oliver, who was camping out in one of the barely habitable rooms of the old eight-unit motel that adjoined the trailer court, was the first to arrive. He was greeted at the door by Maxwell and a rather reluctant Earp. Maxwell had decided to celebrate Christmas as a Franciscan friar, a look which he'd accomplished by chopping off most of the bottom and the sleeves of an old brown terry cloth robe formerly belonging to my late Uncle Ricky. Maxwell had replaced the belt of the bathrobe with a length of rope. Sometime around noon, Maxwell had locked himself in the bathroom of our apartment upstairs and fired up another of my late Uncle Ricky's old possessions, a set of electric hair clippers Maxwell had found in a box in the back of the linen closet. What are you doing? I heard Georgia say. Georgia is normally fairly unflappable, but whatever Maxwell had gotten up to had her rattled. I'm shaving a tonsure, I heard Maxwell say as if that were a perfectly normal activity for six-year-olds, or indeed, anyone, to engage in. You are not, said Georgia. But I want to be authentic. Maxwell yelled, but Georgia confiscated the hair clippers without another word. The tonsureless Franciscan friar was accompanied by a court jester. Somewhere in the boxes of doggy costumes, Maxwell had found a plush jester hat complete with bells. It was jammed over Earp's head. Fortunately, there were no matching pantaloons. Instead, Maxwell had made do with a little red doggy sweater, which he'd complemented with a medievalish ruff constructed from pleated paper towels stitched together with dental floss. Welcome to Y.E. Old Christmas Revels. Maxwell yelled when Oliver came in the door. Huzzah! Oliver said in return. Oliver sat himself down at the table and admired the boar's head until Ledbetter, Katie, and Chamomile arrived in quick succession. This is quite, Katie broke off without finishing what she'd started. It was hard to find words for a Christmas feast that featured a boar's head with prunes for eyes, turnip tusks, and a row of teeth improvised out of pickled baby corn. I think it's very creative, said Chamomile. I hear there is after-dinner entertainment. There is, said Georgia a bit grimly. From what I hear, we can expect a one-boy, one-pug show with intermittent audience participation. 
we all sat down at the table, and Georgia carved the boar's head. Maxwell insisted that the snout be reserved for Earp, who lurked under Maxwell's feet in quite justified anticipation of being snuck a little bit of everything off the kid's plate. After we'd more or less demolished Georgia's rather delicious Christmas dinner, Maxwell announced that he was going out back to bring in the entertainments. What's he going to get? I asked Georgia as I sipped my cup of eggnog and looked around the satiated faces seated at the table. I don't know, said Georgia. He has something on an old wagon hidden under a tablecloth right by the back door. Why'd he take Earp with him? I would bet there's a wardrobe change involved. That poor dog. Oh, Earp's used to it, I said. He had it nearly as bad when your grandmother was alive. I don't know how Maxwell managed it, but somehow, he got a heavily loaded red flyer wagon he'd found somewhere around the place up the back steps and into the bird cage. What is that? Georgia couldn't restrain herself from asking. Maxwell removed the old tablecloth he'd draped over the mysterious object propped up on the old wagon with a flourish. Hear ye, hear ye. Maxwell proclaimed. We all waited for more, but apparently, that was the extent of Maxwell's prepared lines. What is that? Georgia repeated, no more enlightened as to the object's identity now that she could see it clearly. It's a gavel, said Maxwell. A what? His mother asked again. A gavel. A what? Georgia repeated. It's a yule goat, chamomile helpfully interjected while looking down at her phone. It's an ancient Swedish Christmas tradition. They make a giant goat out of straw and put it in the town square. I can see it now, said Ledbetter, although I was not entirely convinced he could. Nancy's generously provided bale of straw had been transformed into something bound together with various bits of mismatched ribbon, but it took a great deal of imagination to recognize that it was supposed to be a goat. Of course, said Oliver. A gavel. It's obvious if you view it from the right angle. What's Erp? I asked. I don't think he's supposed to be the goat herd. He's a mummer, said Maxwell, as if stating the obvious. Poor, put upon Erp was bearing up admirably under the indignity of having a paper plate mask with badly mislocated eye holes brightly painted to look like I was uncertain what tied over his face. His red sweater had been replaced by a sort of casing created by a paper bag, which impeded his ability to walk, but not his ability to collapse against the wheels of the wagon and knock his mask askew. I think the fact that the pug's belly was bursting with the entire snout of George's boar's head roast, plus a sampling of everything off the table, contributed considerably to his torpor. I hoped that my allowance of such festive excesses would not result in an unpleasant trip to the vet and a well-deserved lecture from the professional in question about responsible dog ownership. What's the mask supposed to represent? I asked Maxwell. A fearsome creature. Erp didn't look very fearsome. He looked in imminent danger of falling asleep. Now, said Maxwell, it's time for the caroling. I should have known that Maxwell's conception of caroling would not be restricted to a couple of verses of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer sung while sitting around the table. According to Maxwell, one did not sit to do authentic medieval caroling. According to Maxwell, one danced in a circle while one sang. Did you know about this? I whispered to Georgia as we noisily scooted out our chairs and stood to our feet, too full of holiday spirit to deprive Maxwell of his Christmas wish. I may have helped him do a little internet research on medieval Christmas traditions. Apparently, caroling was banned in churches as disruptive and relegated to the street. I'm going to draw the line at being relegated to the street, I said. It's cold out there. Outside, I could hear the wind whistling through all the myriad cracks in the old wooden building that housed the birdcage cafe. We'd lingered so long at the table that it was getting dark outside, but inside, with the twinkling lights on the garish pink and green aluminum Christmas tree, I'd never witnessed a scene more festive. Erp had managed to divest himself of his paper mummer's costume while no one was watching and had curled up au natural at the base of the Christmas tree. Now, said Maxwell. Are there any requests? Katie suggested Silent Night, and Oliver requested we wish you a Merry Christmas, but I realized I didn't have a single one. There was nothing I could ask for which could improve upon this moment. 
I got a fleeting image of my in-law's Christmas table, with the coordinated china and crystal, the bland but presented to perfection menu, and my disloyal soon-to-be ex-husband sitting there beside me. Not in all the years I'd spent Christmas with them had I felt this warm glow. I was suddenly overwhelmed with a warm and wonderful Christmassy feeling that I hadn't experienced since childhood. I wanted to cry for the second time in days, but instead, I belted out we wish you a Merry Christmas at the top of my lungs while skipping in a circle around a table containing the remains of Y.E. Old Boar's head and a mutilated hay bale decorated with thirty years' worth of Christmas bows salvaged and saved by my great Aunt Geraldine. Of course, Earp slept through the whole thing. The End Did you enjoy this story? Subscribe to Celia's channel for more quirky cozy mysteries. Before you go, if you'd like a free ebook from Celia, you can find the link in the video description.